Opioid addiction is a national public health crisis that affects individuals and families regardless of their age, race, or income. The statistics are overwhelming. More than 130 people die from opioid addiction every day. But there is hope. Recovery is possible. The information contained in these podcasts is solely for informational purposes and should not replace advice from a medical provider when making healthcare decisions. This podcast contains opinionated content and may not reflect the opinions of any organization this podcast is affiliated with. We will discuss opioid use and opioid treatment, which may be triggering for some listeners. Listener discretion is advised. On today's episode of Someone You Know, we have a little bit of a different format. Recently, United States Representative Madeline Dean and her son, Harry Kunan, joined us for a virtual town hall hosted by Independence Blue Cross's Someone You Know Associate Resource Group and was moderated by my colleague, Patrick Flynn, Government Affairs Specialist and co-lead of the Someone You Know Associate Resource Group. Patrick has spoken publicly about his recovery journey from opioid use disorder and advocates for others to achieve a life in recovery. Representative Dean and Harry both recently co-authored a book titled Under Our Roof, A Son's Battle for Recovery, A Mother's Battle for Her Son. Throughout this episode, you will hear their firsthand stories of Harry's journey to long-term recovery and how together they are working to break the stigma of addiction. I'm your host, Heather Major, and this is Someone You Know. I want to once again thank Congresswoman and Harry for being here with us today. As, as we take a deeper dive into this very serious issue exacerbated during the COVID-19 pandemic, I lived what Harry lived and, and how important it is to really talk about this in an open way as we move the needle to trying to break the stigma surrounding addiction. That is something that the Someone You Know group strives to do is, you know, our mission statement says, we are working to break the stigma of addiction in the corporate setting. Whether you are in recovery, supporting a loved one, have lost a loved one, or have been touched by addiction in any way, the Someone You Know group is a place where associates can feel comfortable talking about personal experiences. So I I guess to start off, um, welcome, Congresswoman and Harry, if you'd like to say a few words to to start the program. Harry, you want to go first? Sure. First, thank you, Patrick, and thank you, Steve, uh, for the warm welcome and everybody with the Someone You Know group uh, for having us out today. It's such an important you know, topic. It's something my mom and I are incredibly passionate about, and we you know, so appreciate and value all the work that you're doing um, to really help shatter the stigma because it's such a key aspect of you know, what's really keeping people sick. Um, and keeping people afraid to share those stories. You know, sharing stories of inspiration to eclipse the sorrow, I think is such a good and powerful image, right? You know, and that's what we wanna do because to talk about this and to talk about all aspects of it, you know, the disease can be surrounded in sorrow, but there's so many stories of hope. Um, You know, I'm just one small piece of that, Patrick. There's so many out there. And we just want to share that so people can understand the full picture and what is possible through recovery. Well said. Uh, Patrick, I want to say a sincere thank you for inviting us. Thank you, Independence Blue Cross. I always feel comfortable and at home in your company. Uh, You have always been so kind and welcoming and informative to me. Uh, And so I uh, lift up you, Patrick, and Amber Lee as the co-leads of uh, the Someone You Know Project. Uh, and all the work you're doing uh, to inform, to educate, to get rid of stigma. Uh, I'm just delighted to be any small part of this conversation and love working with you guys. I know you know that. Uh, But I do want to say one word about Steve Farah. Uh, For those of you who are going to read the book or who did read the book, there's a moment in there where I talk about the chance uh, to visit with the Pope uh, literally at a prison, at Kern Fromhold Prison, uh, with Harry. It was a just an extraordinary moment in our lives. The kindness and the connection between us getting to visit the Pope uh, in that prison, uh, the connective tissue was Steve Farah, was Independence Blue Cross, and the organizers of the Pope's visit here. Um, So um, let's just hope to continue that kind of thing. This is a book about 
Uh, really, it's a love story about uh, my love for Harry. It's his story, and I'm proud to have the conversation with you. As I mentioned, Representative Dean and Harry recently wrote a book together called Under Our Roof, A Son's Battle for Recovery, A Mother's Battle for Her Son. We now get to hear about the trials and tribulations of that writing process, how the book is changing lives, and how it came to be. I guess I'll jump right into the first question. Could you, could you talk a little bit about the genesis of deciding to write the book and talk a bit about what the writing process was like for you? The chance to write this book was not my idea and was not Harry's idea. It was actually uh, my elder son's idea, Patrick, uh, Patrick Hanan, who had written a book uh, about his time working in the Obama administration. And his agent came to him a couple of years ago and said, do you have another book in you? And he said, no, but I think my brother and mother have an interesting story to tell. In the, August, in the summer of 2018, that his agent came and sat down with Harry and with me, uh, and we immediately thought, what an interesting idea. Uh, we, we also immediately thought we should tell it separately. And so you'll see that in the book, uh, our voices are separate. We even have separate fonts to signal that difference of voice. We dug right into the idea. You know, and, and part of our background thinking was really, you know, to write this um, story and put our experience out there was, you know, how can we try to, to help someone? And a couple of things that we really hung on to early on were, one, the family component of this disease and how it truly impacts so many, um, so many people, not just the individual who is struggling with a substance use disorder, so what we did initially was we created an outline and we wrote completely separately um, because we didn't want to skew each other's memory or perception of what we had been through to try to make it fit the narrative. We just wanted to write what we had experienced. Um, so as you're going into the book, and especially early on, it can feel that our worlds are so far apart, you know, in, even in the same household. And I think that that's something that is a common experience for family members who are going through this, um, you know, so really that was kind of initially part of our process. We had a wonderful team to help us weave it, weave it back together. Um, but really we went in with that goal of it's a mother son love story. It's a story of hope. Um, and one last thing we really wanted to focus on was, you know, I had felt at times like so much of what can be out in the media really focuses just on, kind of the horror stories and the, the sorrow of active addiction and, and can gloss over what the recovery process looks like. So we, we really wanted to dedicate half of the book to the recovery process and, and the ups and downs and challenges and joys that go along with that. So it's not an afternote. You know, it's really our family's experience through the full, the full range of what, what can and does happen through addiction and recovery. Yeah, I really, really think that is so important, uh, especially the family piece has always been something that's been I've been so passionate about, you know, as as you know, Harry, for, for individuals like us, there's always a lot of outlets that we have to go and get some help for what we're dealing with. But the, the family members don't necessarily always have those same outlets. So to, to lift up the struggles they go through as they are numbing themselves to, to the issue going through active addiction, they are living it very strongly on an everyday basis. So I think that's that's a really important story to tell. And and I really loved the, the part where it was just, you know, back and forth, the different perspectives along the same timeline is, is so powerful to see. Even for me after, you know, six plus years in recovery to go back and sort of relate that to myself, be like, wow, like this is really the stuff that my family was going through on a daily basis that I didn't really know or at that point, sadly enough, care about because all I cared about was was getting that next that next drug. So I think that's it, it's so awesome that you guys did it in, in that way. Uh, just to move on to the to the next question, you talk a lot about in the book, Harry, how the path for you looked a lot different than it does for for some individuals. Can you talk a little bit about that and the privilege that, you know, you talk about kept you out of jail numerous times and why, why you think that is? And then what is a society uh, you believe we could start doing to change that? And then when you're done, I'd, Congresswoman, I'd love to get your thoughts on that as well. Absolutely. I mean, if you read the book, you can see I, I write about just 
a handful of the experiences that I had had um, through my journey of you know active addiction and the lifestyle that I was living, um, which often you know put me in contact and encounters with with the police and with disciplinary boards at school and all of these things. And I write about you know really a couple of factors being kind of the pillars that held together my freedom. Um, you know, the color of my skin, our socioeconomic status, the address on my license, the car that I drove, all of these things um, put together. And, you know, I would find myself in Kensington or other areas, you know, throughout the city. And, and I was often met with a level of forgiveness and grace that so many others out there are not. Um, you know, and, and it's really sad to see what can happen when we try to address a mental health issue with the criminal justice system far too often. I think as a society, as a, you know, culture, that stigma is really creating a growth. And I think it's getting better, but too many people are met with the criminal justice system and, and not with treatment. Um, and it, it, that does a couple of things. It can really permanently impact someone's life. But even on the more intimate level, when you're looking at someone who is needing to reach out for help, the shame that goes along with that and the fear of exposing what's going on because of some of those consequences can be immense and can stop people from getting help. Um, I think the work that Independence Blue Cross is doing, the Someone You Know group is doing, um, is really taking great leaps in order to continue to drive that process forward. Because I think, in my view, the best way that we can combat that is to look at this as a disease and take it for what it is and not look at it as some criminal behavior or moral failing and get people the help and resources that we need in order to recover. Because recovery is possible and treatment does work. So we need to continue to elevate that and deal with and address this issue in that way and not with the criminal justice system. Patrick, to add to that from my experience, uh, what you should know is that much of what was going on behind the scenes of Harry's life in terms of down in Kensington, interaction with the police uh, and other disciplinary boards, although I was involved in some of that, uh, was unknown to me. I was struggling to find out what was going on, what was going wrong, why was his affect becoming flatter and flatter and him becoming sicker and sicker. Uh, and so the hiding was very effective. Um, so it was literally in writing and reading the book that I learned so much of the depths of addiction and how it had hollowed Harry out and also brought him right up close to a criminal justice system that somehow saw him differently than so many other people. So um, as he was in recovery, we talked about this a little, but literally the writing of the book uh, made it so apparent uh, that uh, white privilege played an important role. Um, and, and, I, and I won't say that it played the appropriate role, um, but it played an important role in Harry not having a criminal record. How many times, and, and we knew this from our own personal experience with other families who struggle with addiction, um, that folks wind up with criminal records that not only derail them in terms of uh, being incarcerated, but also derail them for their careers, uh, derail them in terms of their economic future and their family's economic future. Uh, we incarcerate people disproportionately based on their skin color uh, or based on whether they're poor. So as a state representative, I've fought um, our criminal justice system to try to change our criminal uh, attributes um, to, to reduce and get rid of mandatory minimums, um, to decriminalize uh, possession, uh, to do a lot of things to examine um, the, the unfair, unequal, and inappropriate criminalization of so many behaviors uh, connected to addiction and substance uh, abuse. So that's something I fought at the state level. I'm continuing to fight at the federal level. And of course, it's something that's really been uh, very much in the forefront in terms of criminal justice and policing in our country. There's no doubt the COVID-19 pandemic has had a grave impact on those struggling with active addiction, but also those that are in long-term recovery. 
It has impacted individual behaviors and also how we as a society treat the disease of addiction, which Harry and Representative Dean will now discuss. It has been a severe impact and it's been so hard. So much of recovery is based in community support. You know, there's not one one pathway or one method, but a lot of it can be support groups, you know, whether that's 12 step or another method. And I know for me, when I first got out of treatment, the ability to meet other people and to connect and to feel that connection was so critical to my, you know, growing in recovery and staying with it um, because recovery can be incredibly challenging. Um, so to have people in your corner that you can lean on and, and feel a part of, you know, a group, whatever that may be, is is so valuable. And when COVID, you know, really kind of kicked off in March of last year and all of those meetings became virtual on Zoom and other platforms, uh, the ability to connect and to feel that connection, both for people who are brand new and also for people who have been in longer term recovery was really significant. You know, what I have seen personally through my work and just being in recovery and knowing so many people is there are far more people now struggling, you know, people that that had seemed really stable in recovery um, that have relapsed, you know, or are sort of on the on the verge and and struggling to to stay connected and stay a part of. Um, so, you know, we need to continue to to talk about this, I think. Prior to COVID, there was a really good level of momentum talking about the opioid epidemic, and it was getting some coverage, and people were beginning to talk about it and make progress. And once COVID really kind of took over the media cycle, the focus shifted, um, you know, understandably so, but in a way that that took the focus off. And if you look at alcohol sales, you look at it, it's not just opioids; it's any and all substances. Um, and mental health. I mean, people are feeling isolated as a result of a lot of the, you know, thing, precautions that are in place, the social distancing, all of these things that are meant to protect people from COVID can really be counterintuitive um, to recovery. So we need to balance that. We need to talk about it. And we need to continue to let people know that different resources are available. I think one positive, you know, that I that I have seen is you know the ability to offer more telehealth services and, and get access of treatment to people in different and new ways. So that's that's a positive that's come out of this. But overall, it has had a really significant and negative impact on people in recovery because of that connection piece and because of the lack of attention that the issue as, as a whole is getting. I want to add to that. Uh, I keep looking at the numbers, and the numbers are staggering. Before the pandemic, we talked about 60 or 70,000 people dying a year of overdose. Um, spring 19 to spring 20, it looked like the numbers were somewhere in the area of 80,000 plus people dying of overdose. Uh, the most recent reading I've done on it is it looks like for the year of the pandemic, we could have seen 100,000 deaths uh, from overdose. Um, Patrick, you and I have talked about this. This is, I call it a jetliner a day, every single day of souls dying in this country, being robbed of their families, being robbed of their communities, ripping families apart, frankly. Uh, and so the impact of COVID, uh, as you know, clinically um, and, and importantly in terms of delivery of, of um, health, uh, health care is, is devastating. I'll say something on the bright side, which is what I really appreciated in, in uh, Washington as we were passing different pieces of legislation to uh, address um, the uh, COVID pandemic. Uh, in each one, we had discussions around uh, how will this actually help get us to the other side of this pandemic and recognize uh, the crisis of addiction and substance use disorder, mental health issues as a result of the pandemic. So all of the dollars and resources toward vaccine, uh, the stimulus dollars, frankly, um, the, the testing, all of those things had woven in them um, a, a focus on mental health uh, and substance abuse. But very noticeably, uh, I, I couldn't be more excited 
about the American Rescue Plan, because that is a statement of values. That is a statement of sending money, resources uh, to the people most in need, the vulnerable among us. And you know in that is $1.65 billion dollars uh, for substance abuse and mental health associated, associated resources. Um, so um, government has a role to play. We all have a role to play. Uh, insurance industries, healthcare care industries, uh, nonprofits, but government has a role to play. And we're putting our money where our mouth is, uh, at least to try to begin to get people connected to vaccines, connected uh, to uh, health care to recovery, to warm hands off, to all kinds of things. Breaking the stigma of addiction is one of the main purposes of our Someone You Know campaign. There is help, and most importantly, there is hope. Patrick has been so instrumental in leading the Someone You Know Associate Resource Group at Independence Blue Cross, with a goal of breaking that stigma and giving Independence Associates a safe place to share their personal experience. He also works firsthand with many companies that are now trying to destigmatize addiction and fostering programs of support for their employees. So now Patrick, Representative Dean, and Harry discuss what more can be done in the workplace to destigmatize addiction. You know, my mother growing up was a uh, secretary for a criminal court judge in Lackawanna County here in Scranton. And every day she would go to work and and have to wonder where I was. Was I alive? Was I arrested? Was I was I safe? Where was I? And wasn't able really to talk about what was happening because she felt stigmatized by it and didn't want people to think, oh, Kathy Flynn is a is a bad mother because her son suffers from substance use disorder, right? And those and those lies that are told. And that's really the what what we believed we needed to start doing at Independence is give those those family members who are coming to work every day with the weight of the world on their shoulders, a place to be able to open up and talk about this. So what what do you both think from your perspectives other companies should be doing to destigmatize addiction for their employees? So I went after treatment, I went and I was not working for care and treatment centers. I was in a different industry and you know I, I knew very closely so many of the people that I worked with um, but was so uncomfortable to let anyone in. Right. I think, you know, for me in the workplace, part of the stigma of, you know, addiction is there's also a stigma can be a stigma of recovery. You know, even after I had been in recovery for a few years, um, you know, to tell someone that I was in recovery, that I was an addict um, is something that was so uncomfortable because I knew the, the connection that that would make in their mind to what was he doing before. Right. And they would think of sort of all of that, that negative impact of the sorrow of what we go through. Um, that's the connection. You know, I think for me, starting to work for care and treatment centers and being able to sort of more openly share just who I am and what I've been through has been such a freeing experience to let others in and let them know. And the, and the overwhelming majority in terms of the response has been very positive. You know, someone will come up to me wherever I go and say they know someone, you know, and I think that's what you're doing here is just connecting those dots of, even though we don't want to talk about it, um, everybody has their own story. It could be a loved one, it could be themselves, it could be a neighbor, a friend, um, whatever that might look like. So the more that we talk about it, you know, and that's why through the book, we wanted to really, you can't explain recovery without understanding the ugly and messy side of active addiction, because without that, the value of recovery is just, you, you can't comprehend how meaningful and how significant it is. So I think, you know, it's something that I see as a real value is sharing stories of hope, you know, letting people when they're comfortable to share their own story. And I think the more stories that we get out there, the more people can start to realize that there are people in recovery all around us. And we might not even realize that because they feel that shame and that stigma. Now, one other thing I just wanna mention on this, it's just to talk about how significant that stigma is and that shame that I felt. You know, I wrote in the book about, you know, an experience of 
being so ashamed that I was so afraid to tell the truth of what was happening. And I would rather risk dying than letting my mom know, someone who loves me, someone who in hindsight only wanted to help me. But in that moment, all I could see was fear that if she knew what I had become and the person that I would love, she would want nothing to do with me. Not knowing that I was suffering from a disease, that I had a substance use disorder, I just thought I was a horrible person. And I didn't want to put that guilt that I felt, that shame that I felt on her. And in that moment, it felt safer to die. And that's something that I think no one should ever have to experience. And the more that we can break down the stigma, the sooner people will reach out for help, access treatment, and start on the process of recovery. And I think it's just, I love what you're doing with the Someone You Know group because it's such an important part. And we need to have those conversations at home, in the workplace, with our friends, anywhere that we can to continue to break that down. You know what? Uh, I think we could all take a page out of Independence's book, uh, which is uh, to do exactly what you're doing. Uh, you know, to wear these pins, to say, I am someone you know. My family is someone you know. My son, I'm the mother of an addict. My son is an addict. To, to be able to say those things in any enterprise, any business. Uh, when we wrote the book and, and we entitled it Under Our Roof, we chose that for a number of reasons. But one of the reasons we chose it was to say, uh, look, this could happen under our roof. We think we're a relatively ordinary American family. Uh, if it can happen under our roof, it can happen under anybody's. And when we published the book, Patrick, we sent out copies to quite a few members, uh, colleagues of mine in Congress, uh, and they would come in. We'd be voting on the floor, and to person after person would come forward and say, I got your book, I read your book, and immediately make a connection. Uh, my son, my brother, uh, my nephew, my cousin, uh, my co um, So, and, and they just had this lightness of, that's so great you were willing to talk about it. So I think that's the most powerful thing you can do uh, to reduce stigma and shame that we might feel as the family member or powerfully what Harry said. And I did not understand that until I read his words, uh, that the shame within the person, him and herself, is so great, is so heavy. Uh, they would risk dying before coming forward. It's such a misunderstanding of the disease of addiction. It's such a misunderstanding, uh, perhaps, of love. And that's, that's because the disease of addiction interferes with that pathway. Um, but uh, we just thought, if we can say it, uh, this happened to us, uh, I bet we'll make connections with others. Uh, and that will help bring down the shame and the stigma. In our final segment of today's episode, we would be remiss if we did not discuss the overall theme of season two of our podcast, which is focused on the next generation of young people facing the opioid crisis and the role of collegiate recovery programs. The Independence Blue Cross Foundation has funded the development of a collegiate recovery model to support recovery and sobriety for college students and is expanding these programs with schools across the Southeastern Pennsylvania region. And on a parallel path, Representative Dean recently introduced legislation about federal funding for colleges and universities to create collegiate recovery programs on their campuses and raise awareness to end the stigma, which Representative Dean will now discuss. And then Harry will talk about his experience of living in active addiction while in college and the resources he believes are vital in creating an impactful collegiate recovery program. So I introduced uh, or my office, and I introduced the End Stigma Act, which would be grants to universities and colleges, including community colleges, HBCUs, in order to create programming for those who are suffering or are um, struggling uh, with addiction, but also to educate the others around, whether it's administration or students, to take down the stigma uh, that happens on campus, the shame and the hiding uh, of substance use disorder. Uh, so to come forward with the best resources and programming to connect people, to educate folks, and also to connect them. Again, with the idea of literally the name of the bill is the End Stigma Act to reduce the stigma on a college campus where 
I felt that the conversation around substance use disorder and addiction just was shrouded, absolutely shrouded uh, in silence. My experience on a college campus was that I was caught up in the height of my addiction when I was at school. And I was continually finding myself in trouble, you know, and going in front of the judicial board. And everything was directly and indirectly related to my substance use. But instead of being offered a lifeline, a resource, uh, information, I was met with disciplinary action over and over and over again. And, you know, I take some responsibility for that as I was doing my best to try to hide what was going on and manipulate the situation. But in all of those moments, you know, and I know my mom talks about this pretty clearly. She was a professor at the school where I was and trying to get to the bottom of it. Not once was anything about recovery, about treatment, about substance use disorder or mental health ever put in front of me. You know, I had no idea as to what resources were out there and no idea as to a community of people in recovery who I might want to try to get involved in and maybe change what I was doing. So I think the more that we have those on college campuses, I think the End Stigma Act to really bring that information, education, and prevention work to college campuses can only add value. Um, because I know when I was there, it left our family. Um, it, you know, kind of blew up my shot at an education at that point in time and, and left us all struggling for a few years afterwards, after I left the university, because there were no resources or no, no opportunity to see another way. I want to extend a sincere thank you to Representative Dean and Harry. Their book, Under Our Roof, A Son's Battle for Recovery, A Mother's Battle for Her Son, is available at all major book retailers, and the link is in our show notes. And I also want to extend a great thank you to our very own Patrick Flynn, who moderated this conversation. You can also listen to Patrick's full personal story on his journey to long-term recovery as I interviewed him on season one of Someone You Know. I'm Heather Major, and this is Someone You Know.